Well, thank you very much, uh, Colonel Ingalls, for that, uh, for that introduction. It's a real uh, pleasure to be uh, invited to provide the opening remarks for the conference uh, and an honor to be uh, among the Canadian Army again, who I had the, the, uh, the pleasure of serving with in Kandahar in 2009-2010, and with the U.S. Army, who I uh, served with as well as a civilian in the Coalition Provisional Authority as a, as a secondee in 2003 and 2004. Uh, I was already predisposed to accept uh, an invitation, given the high regard in which I uh, hold Kim Nossel, who I consider the Dean of uh, Canadian Foreign Policy Analysts. But Kim sealed the deal when he invoked the legacy of my predecessor as the President of the Canadian International Council. It piqued my curiosity. What would John Holmes uh, think about the world today? How would he assess it? Now, you might not know who John Holmes was, but you probably do know the term that he coined to describe Canada's role in the world. Writing in the 1960s, he described Canada as a middle power. It was uh, his concept, and it was the organization that he led, now, uh, now called CIC, but then called the Canadian Institute for International Affairs, that seeded that concept in the public imagination in Canada. Now, Holmes was a senior diplomat who had contributed to many of the negotiations that led to the creation of the post-war era after the victory of the Allies in World War II. He led Canada's embassy in Moscow shortly after the war. He led uh, our mission to the fledging United Nations. Like many of the other colleagues of his, I think we think of Lester Pearson, Hume Rong, Norman Robertson, some of the most famous Canadian diplomats. He was uh, appreciated by many of his American, British, and other uh, counterparts for the uniquely Canadian perspective he brought uh, in those early days of creating the post-war order. But unlike his colleagues, he soon found himself forced out of government. Holmes was expelled from the Foreign Service in 1960 for his sexual orientation. This act of discrimination against a servant of Canada was a travesty, but there was a silver lining, at least from the perspective of our country, because he could then take that unique perspective forged at the, uh, at the negotiating table when the post-war order was created and share that with the public. He drew on his experience to explain to his fellow citizens how power actually worked in the international system. And when he explained to our uh, fellow citizens what distinct contribution Canada had to play in global affairs, it was tempered not by the sometimes exaggerated self-regard of a country that sees itself as uniquely virtuous in international affairs, but by the hard realities of power. Holmes had no time for Canadians that thought we should be neutral or a pacifist nation, keeping our both superpowers at a distance so that we might uh, advance causes based on our own independent moral judgment. Rather, he argued that Canada had influence precisely because we were aligned with the United States and other liberal democracies. We had a seat at the table because we had made our loyalties clear and contributed men, material, and money to advance our shared objectives. What made Canada a middle power was that inside that alliance, we retained enough ability to set our own course. We could draw on our relationships outside NATO with the Commonwealth, with Francophone countries, as a major donor to developing countries to do things that other allies couldn't do, like lead a peacekeeping force that helped the UK back down in the Suez crisis without appearing to have bowed to American pressure. So Canada was both allied and autonomous. And we derive power from both of those characteristics. By aligning ourselves with the United States and other democracies, we benefited from our shared power. And by retaining a certain degree of independence of initiative, we could wield power within the alliance as well. As Holmes put it, being a middle power meant that we were, quote, a loyal ally without being a satellite, preserving as much of our own sovereignty and identity as compatible with the economic and military realities of the nuclear age. Now, the concept caught the imagination of a generation of foreign policy thinkers, diplomats, and military leaders. Successive governments of either political stripe described Canada's role in the world in this way, and it helped articulate a broad foreign policy consensus across the partisan divide. In fact, one that lasted for decades after Holmes. It was such a compelling concept that it's still being invoked now, 30 years after the disappearance of the context in which that middle, concept, uh, middle power concept was, uh, was invoked of the Cold War. Now, we can debate how relevant the middle power concept is today, but I don't think there's any doubt that it was extremely relevant in the formation of our alliance in the first place. I'd like to invite you to think back to the, the late 1940s, 
The world's democracies emerged from World War II in very different situations. The U.S. Principal, the U.S. principally responsible for the victory and flush with the largest economy the world had ever seen was expected to return to its roots as an isolationist power. Since the days of George Washington, the most consistent tendency in U.S. foreign policy was to avoid, quote-unquote, foreign entanglements. The U.K. was also victorious, but flat on its back economically, and so desperately overstretched in its colonial, uh, in its far-flung empire that it started shedding colonies in a hurry, from India to Israel. The government of Clement Attlee knew that it could no longer hold the line in Europe should a new menace arise. Now, Canada was extraordinarily close to both, deeply loyal to an empire whose flag we continued to fly. And throughout that Second World War, of course, we, we flew the Red Ensign. But we were now fully integrated into the U.S. military orbit since the 1940 Ogdensburg Treaty. If any country had an interest in deepening the special relationship between the, these two Anglophone giants, it was Canada. The first signs of a new menace, in fact, arose not in Europe, but in Ottawa, of all places. We were talking about this with Kim and Colonel Ingalls last night. It was just days after the end of the Second World War, after, after the surrender of Japan, that a cipher clerk at the Soviet embassy in Ottawa defected with evidence of an extensive espionage network throughout Canada, throughout the Canadian forces, throughout Canadian government. It was so novel for us to hear that our wartime ally, the Soviet Union, was spying on us at such a large scale that at first Igor Guzenko couldn't find anyone in the Canadian government to accept his, his uh, defection. He went to the RCMP. They didn't believe his story. He went to the uh, Department, of Just, uh, Department of Justice, and it was closed for the evening. He even went to the main newspaper in Ottawa at the time, the Ottawa Journal, and they didn't believe his story. So he had to actually go back to his apartment building and hide out with a neighbor while uh, former colleagues from the embassy came to try and, uh, and apprehend him. Finally, he convinced the RCP to accept his story, but our then Prime Minister, William Lyne Mackenzie King, was so worried about offending this, the Soviets that he was prepared to send Guzenko back to his fate in Moscow. And it took a disobedient Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs to grant Guzenko asylum and start sounding the alarm bell with our allies. Over the next two, two and a half years, relations with the Soviet Union would deteriorate as tensions flared in Iran, Greece, and Turkey. And, of course, Germany, which was jointly administered by the U.S., the U.K., France, and the Soviet Union. But public attitudes changed slowly. And the newly minted United Nations was very popular. Surely, the thinking went, the growing disagreements could be worked out in the Security Council. Now, Canadian diplomats played a disproportionate role in the establishment of the U.N., drafting key documents like the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, and the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade. Lester Pearson himself served as the very first president of the General Assembly of the UN. And it was this talent for building institutions and setting out the rules that would govern all of us is one reason why the United, Ke the United Kingdom insisted on having Canada at the table when their Foreign Secretary, Ernest Bevan, first put the idea of a transatlantic security pact to the US. That very first conversation in the early days of, 18, of 1948 was between the UK, the US, and Canada, no one else. He knew that, US, uh, that Canadian diplomats were the biggest champions uh, and would press for a, as broad and a deep a mandate for what would become NATO, constantly pressing other allies to go further in aligning not just our military objectives, but our political and economic ones as well. And this was the other reason Bevan wanted Canada to table. He knew our diplomats would propose a more ambitious degree of integration and press more firmly than others. In the early weeks of the negotiation, we're in March, uh, April 1948 at this point, the U.S. was divided between those that wanted to move quickly and those that still sought to avoid foreign entanglements. Canada tipped the hand of the former by being the first country to publicly endorse a formal treaty. All of these discussions were actually held in, in complete secrecy at the time. Uh, because of the recent memories of the Second World War and the reluctance of, the, of public opinion to accept the fact that we were heading towards another international conflict. But it was our then Foreign Minister, Louis Saint Laurent, who stood in the House of Commons in April 1948 and said, the world's democracies must unite in a new ally to protect ourselves from the Soviet Union. And then our diplomats actually singled out the recalcitrant U.S. diplomats one by one, including the influential George Kennan, and wore them out with their arguments, with, uh, with our arguments for a full treaty. 
it wasn't just the United States. When the French government dug in their heels on the demands on demands that the United States could not make, it was our ambassador in Paris, Georges Vanier, who went on to become our governor general, who talked them down. Canada never achieved the full extent of political and economic integration that it sought for NATO. Article 2, which outlines the political character of the alliance, was a significant dilution. But uh, because Canadians had pushed so hard for the closest possible union, the resulting treaty produced an alliance more tightly aligned than anyone could have predicted just a year before. Now, <clears throat> why am I going into so much detail about Canada's role in the formation of NATO? It's because I think there are intriguing parallels between the late 1940s and the world order today. I'll name four. First, a, global, uh, a shifting global balance of power. Two, brazen behavior by states rising to challenge the rules-based international order. See, uh, three, simultaneous threats to liberal democracy, both at the domestic and the international level. And fourth, a fierce debate within democracies over whether sovereignty is best pursued by collaborating with or remaining independent of other democracies. First, let's look at the shifting balance of power. For much of the 20th century, the UK and Germ uh, early 20th century, the UK and Germany had dominated international affairs. By 1945, of course, the latter was defeated, and the UK, while it had prevailed, was so exhausted that it uh, was no longer able to project itself as a top military power. Our mutual allies in the war, the United States and the Soviet Union, had filled the void created by the decline of the great powers of Western Europe. In 2019, the, the, the US is losing its predominance, and Russia, while of course reduced from its former Soviet self, increasingly defies the United States where it pleases, from Syria and even to Venezuela in the background, backyard, so-called backyard of the United States. Now China is a more significant challenger to US power. Its military power might lag, lag behind, but it is on a path to overtake the United States in economic weight within 20 years. And in soft power, amazingly enough, it may already be on a par with the United States. The Beijing model seems more attractive to many Asian and African countries, and many would prefer to collaborate with Xi Jinping's China than with Donald Trump's America. Now is often, now is then the balance of power is shifting under our feet. When power relations change suddenly, rising powers start pushing the limits, challenging norms established by the previous. Uh, arrangement. We've already seen how the Soviets engaged in espionage inside our countries in a scale not previously seen. In countries that dominated in the East, it did not hesitate to eliminate the free press, crush independent civil society, and murder inconvenient politicians, most famously the foreign minister of Czechoslovakia in that same year of 1948. In our day, Russia has launched chemical weapons attacks on British soil. It has supported extremist parties within democratic states. It has subjected countries that criticize it to disinformation campaigns in, uh, designed to confuse and discourage our own citizens. China, for its part, kidnaps ex-diplomats from countries which displease it and subject them to interrogation methods that many consider to be a violation of the Vienna Convention that protects diplomats. Now, as then, Norms that used to govern international behavior are being discarded as the newly powerful stretch their wings. Third, liberal democracy is facing a determined challenge both at home and abroad. Back then, political parties directed from Moscow grew in influence inside our nations, supported by newspapers that took their editorial line from similar quarters. In 1946, it looked likely that Greece would fall into the Soviet orbit, and France and Italy Parties deeply hostile democracy were on the march, winning 26% and 19% of the vote in each respective country in that period. There were real divisions within our countries that the Soviets could work with. Liberal democracy had its critics in the 1940s, and they had a point. Misguided economic policies had exacerbated a terrible economic crisis, generating profound inequality and social injustice. Canadians themselves joined many other established democracies in flirting with ideologies of the far left and of the far right, as uh, far right before the war and the far left afterwards. In fact, there were two members of parliament in Ottawa that represented the Communist Party, and one of them was eventually found to be collaborating with the Soviet government. Today, democratic parties are challenged by an unprecedented interest by citizen parties of the far left and the far right. The patience of many voters in our democratic processes seems to be wearing thin, 
for citizens exacerbated by those on the other side of the political divide, sometimes victory over those parties begins to take precedence over preserving the institutions those parties are fighting for. Hostile foreign powers happily exploit these growing divisions in our society. Russia supported the Leave campaign in the Brexit referendum. It supported the candidacy of Donald Trump and various parties on extreme, on, actually on both extreme ends of the European political spectrum. The ostensible goal is to polarize the population and exacerbate the frustration that citizens have with their fellow citizens. Now as then, liberal democracy faces challenges on the domestic as well as the international front. Fourth, think about the debates that North American and Western, countries, Western European countries had about sovereignty in the 1940s. I've already mentioned the isolationist tradition in the United States before the war. Many, many Americans were proud of that nation's independence of action and disdainful of alliances that would draw it into the fights of what were then considered a particularly bellicose group of people in Europe. Now the opposite impression. Uh, furthermore, the US Constitution assigned the power to wage war to Congress, not to the President. So asking the US to automatically come to the defense of another democracy must be unconstitutional since it would override the prerogatives of Congress. For many in the United States, being sovereign meant not entering into binding treaties. For its part, France objected to an overly confrontational approach with the USSR, in part because Moscow, the Moscow-friendly Communist Party enjoyed such high levels of support through France, and also because France saw it as a potential intermediary between the United States and the, so and the Soviet Union. For many in France, sovereignty meant preserving total freedom of action in strategic affairs. In 2019, as citizens feel less assured that their countries retain any real power in the face of growing global threats, the instinct to invoke sovereignty more and more loudly leads some countries to take rash and self-defeating measures, like jettisoning the partnerships that allow them genuine control in an increasingly global economy. The UK is the most extreme example of this, with a small majority of citizens willing to reduce the influence that country has over its principal trading partners under the guise of quote unquote taking back control. But we see this confusion in the sovereign, uh, over sovereignty in the words of a president of the United States who claims that the alliances and the institutions that the US created to amplify its own power somehow constrain it. I also invoke the memory of the 1940s to show that dramatic change is possible in international security in a short period of time. When Igor Gozenko, when that Gozenko affair broke in 1946, no one imagined that the world's democracies would respond to the growing Soviet threat by building a new alliance. But with three years of remarkable diplomacy, it overcame each of the objections to greater cooperation. Truman cajoled Congress into accepting treaty obligations that would constrain the constitutional prerogatives of that institution. Through his doctrine, the Marshall Plan, and then NATO, America did a 180 degree turn in its foreign policy traditions, shedding isolationism for the most robust commitment to global engagement imaginable. In return, Western European countries and Canada relinquished final authority over our war-making capabilities to the alliance. Even France went along. Until George, uh, uh, Charles de Gaulle suspended France's participation in the command structure and kicked NATO out of Paris uh, almost 20 years later. In signing the North American Treaty on April 4th, 1949, 12 liberal democracies committed themselves to the defense of one another. They subordinated their sovereignty to the goal of maximizing the power they would yield together. By pooling our sovereignty with other democracies, we arguably created the greatest power that had ever been assembled. NATO stood tall at the front lines of the Cold War and wore down the opposing Warsaw Pact. Within NATO, Armies massed on the we uh, western side of the Iron Curtain for decades, and the Soviet Union decided that stalemate was preferable to a new, new world war. The solidarity that drove this pooling of sovereignty required a new narrative that, about what united these countries that, in fact, had spent far more of their recent history at war with one another than at peace. The countries that made up NATO had a far deeper history of conflict than of collaboration. Thus was born the concept of, quote, unquote, the West as a single entity, the idea that there was some kind of unity to a disparate set of countries that extended from the Elbe all the way to the Pacific Ocean, from Berlin all the way to British Columbia. There had not been a single military formation of any kind across Europe since the Roman Empire, by some accounts, but nostalgia for the quote-unquote West that included both the defeated Germans and the victorious Brits and free French 
and others soon made our alliance seem predestined. But in the perspective of 1948, it felt anything but beforehand. Now, to be sure, 2019 is not 1948. To name just a few difference, differences, the U.S. is falling in the global balance of power, not rising. Liberal democracies are not confined to Western Europe and to North America, but spread out across six continents. There is no single ideological rival, rival that's challenging democracy at home, but in fact two, authoritarian China and populist nationalist Russia. But I believe that the similarities are more relevant than the differences. Then, as now, liberal democracies faced a sudden and dangerous new challenge, both at home and abroad. Will we be up to the challenge of combining our power to preserve our interests in today's much more dangerous world order? I believe we can. And I sense a willingness on the part of Canada to play its traditional role. Our foreign minister, Christian Freeland, told the House of Commons two years ago that, quote, we can and we must play an active role in the preservation and strengthening of the global order from which we've benefited so greatly. Doing so is in our interest. Because our own open security, our own open society is most secure in a world of open societies, and it is under threat when open societies are under threat. The leader of the opposition, Andrew Scheer, told a Montreal audience just a month ago that, quote unquote, a new era of great rivalry is upon us. On one side are the free democracies, and on the other, the imperialist, despotic, and corrupt regimes that seek to destabilize the rules-based international order. Canada must always side with those who value freedom, democracy, human rights, and the rule of law. The alliance that became NATO began with an ambitious dream, one that never materialized. Ernest Bevan and Lester Pearson in that famous conversation in March of 1948 imagined a federation of democracies stretching from Central Europe to the Pacific Ocean. Now, I don't have a specific new alliance or institution to recommend, but I believe that if we apply the same urgency that our forebears did in the 1940s, we can find a way of combining the power of the world's democracies into a new and effective force for good. In the best tradition of a Canada that seeks to unite democracies around a single purpose, let me propose an approach that might respond to the dangers present in the world order emerging today. The shift in the global balance of power today is not so much from the US to China, I would argue, as it is a gradual dispersion of power more generally. As Moises Naim pointed out in the book, The End of Power, institutions from the state to companies to religious organizations no longer hold the sway they one did, once did in their various domains. It is this loss of power that drives some political actors to turn their clock, to turn back the clock on international cooperation in a misguided effort to win back a sense of sovereignty they enjoyed in the past. I would argue sovereignty is the right place to start. It's the right concept to start with. But we increase our power over our own lives not by embracing competition with our friends and allies. We increase our sovereignty by acquiring influence over our economy and over our society at the level at which both increasingly operate, which is globally. This requires banding together with the largest number of countries to pool our common efforts to exercise influence at that level. So our overarching goal should be to expand our sovereignty by banding together. But because we are democracies, we should expand popular sovereignty, pooling as much power together and then placing it at the disposal of citizens. Cajoling democracies to align more closely won't be easy, particularly with a unilateralist president in power in, the, in uh, Washington, DC. But the issues requiring great unity among democracies proliferate daily. Now that technology dominates our lives, for example, could liberal democracies adopt a common approach to the implement, implementation of the 5G, 5G network, this architecture for, uh, for data that will be so pervasive, in a way that protects the rights of individual citizens, no matter which democracy they live in? Could we present a common front when managing relations with an increasingly aggressive China across a wide range of policy issues? Could we monitor foreign interference in electoral processes in one another's countries to minimize the confusion and division that Russia seeks to sow? These are practical problems that a pragmatic power like Canada could help solve through its convening power, demonstrating utility beyond our modest size. 
Building any new alliance begins with framing interests in common. The shared goal of expanding popular sovereignty, I believe, provides a basis for such a frame. If power requires joining forces, then we should maximize the amount of power we can amass together and place it at the service of voters. To do so, we should integrate our security and military forces as much as possible. We should strive to maximize our economic and social outcomes through the kind of integration that drove dramatic improvements in the quality of life in post-war Europe and North America. We should consider regulatory alignment to maximize the trade and investment flows that drive high growth. Now, once common interests are defined, we can build institutions to uphold them. Coordination at the political level could start with something as simple as regular summits between leaders. An apparatus at the officials level would help prepare summits and impl implement the outcomes, not unlike the way G7 countries turn leaders' declarations into policy. Given our shared commitment to popular sovereignty, we could also explore cooperation between the domestic institutions that preserve citizens' rights. Members of this alliance should help one another uphold democratic values and traditions. We have an interest not only in the power we build together, but ensuring that the public benefits from that power. We could monitor one another's elections to preserve their integrity. A neutral, objective perspective from a Spanish or German or Indian perspective might actually carry more weight than if uh, a government minister from one party or the other passes judgment on how free and fair our elections are, for example. Members of this alliance should help one another uphold our democratic values and traditions because we have an interest not only in the power we build together, but in the citizens. This new solidarity between democracies might end up looking somewhat like the North Atlantic community that Canadian diplomats once proposed during the negotiations that created NATO. This time, the community would not be limited to North America and Western Europe, but to all continents where liberal democracy thrives. In conclusion, John Holmes called Canada a middle power. I don't think the term applies anymore, since we no longer live in a Cold War where we derive strength either by loyalty to one superpower or by generating useful solutions to countering the influence of another. But I do think that the broader role that Canada played as a uniter of democracies remains relevant and available to us today. We see this role playing out yet again in the face of the Venezuela crisis where Canada's contribution has been to unite the democracies of Latin America in a new multilateral body known as the Lima Group. That's because our natural home is with the world's democracies. Even when those democracies disagree with one another, we find a way to bring them together. And I believe that role could enjoy support from both liberals and conservatives, the two parties most likely to prevail in the coming federal election. Canadians of all stripes embrace democracy. Some might like certain democracies better than others. We can each think of bilateral relationships that uh, are, are troublesome to us. But that drive to bring partners together to smooth out the differences and to find pragmatic solutions to unite us, that's quintessentially Canadian. Building a new alliance that extends beyond the West will prove challenging, but that's the kind of challenge Canada has excelled at in the past. It's time to unite the world's democracies once again.